Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Innal hamdalillah. Innal hamdalillah wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da. Qad qala tabaraka wa ta'ala fi kalamihi al-majid wal furqan al-hamid ba'da a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala an-nabiyya ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa shafi'ina wa habibina wa sanadina wa mawlana Muhammadi wa barik wa sallim wa qala al-nabiyyu sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam man salla alayhi saratan wahida sallallahu alayhi biha ashara wa kama qala alayhi saratu wa sallam subhanaka la ilma nana illa ma'allamtana innaka antan azizun hakim rabbi zidni ilma Inshallah in tonight's recitation we will be going over the 15th juz of the Holy Qur'an. And the 15th juz comprises of two chapters, Surah Bani Israel and Surah Al-Kahf. So the recitation will begin with Surah Banu Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhanal ladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير. Glorious is he who made his servant travel by night from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa, whose environs we have blessed so that we let him see of our signs. Surely, Allah is the All-Hearing, the All-Seeing. Surah Bani Israel begins with the mention of the miraculous journeys of Isra and Mi'raj. Isra refers to the night travel that takes place from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. That's known as Isra. And Mi'raj is known as the ascension that takes place from Masjid al-Aqsa to the heavens the skies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala visits, and then Sidratul Muntaha, Baytul Ma'mur, and Allah Rabbul Izzat's divine presence itself. The general understanding amongst the ulama and What, bec- what seems the more correct opinion based on the verses of the Holy Qur'an is that this journey in its entirety takes place with both body and soul of the Prophet ﷺ. There are some that elude that this was a vision of the Prophet ﷺ. It was a dream. And... The, the issue that arises with that is if this was simply a dream then it wouldn't be considered a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was no need to mention this in such splendor and grandeur. In fact, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returns from the mi'raj he left in most traditions from the house of Umm Muhani radiyallahu ta'ala anha. And when he returns he mentions the entire incident to Umm Muhani. And Umm Muhani, radiyallahu ta'ala anha, she tells the Prophet sallallahu that don't tell others, especially the kuffar, of what you're telling me because they won't believe you. If it was a dream, then this would never be the instruction of Umm Muhani because everybody sees dreams. There's nothing to object about. It's only because it took place in the physical manner, body and soul, that Umm Muhani, radiyallahu ta'ala, is saying to the Prophet that if you tell the people this, then they won't believe. Second, we find in the books of Hadith that when the Prophet ﷺ does mention it to the people, there are two reactions. There are some who are new Muslims. It comes in the books of Tariq that those new Muslims are so bewildered by what takes place, they left Islam. And the Quraysh themselves, they begin to mock the Prophet ﷺ. Once again, if it was a vision and a dream, what's there to mock about? The Prophet ﷺ has said all sorts of things in terms of divine revelation from Allah until now. 
So if this was simply a dream that the Prophet ﷺ saw, a vision, then there's nothing for the Quraysh to laugh and mock about. It's only because the Prophet ﷺ is saying that I did this physically that they then respond by saying that it's impossible for you to do. And they mock, and then the incident between Abu Bakr ta'ala an, and the Quraysh, where the Quraysh, they approach Abu Bakr ta'ala an, who had not seen the Prophet ﷺ that morning up until that time. And when they see Abu Bakr ta'ala an, they, they fashion the objection in, in, the manner, in a manner where uh, it seems as if they're posing a question. And the question that's posed to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is that, you know, you're, you're a very intellectual man. You're very astute. Your business has... Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala was a tremendous uh, businessman, Tajir. And he was very successful uh, in his business. And so they said to him that you're very clever, you're intellectual. We have a very simple question for you. We just want to know how long it takes to get, go from here, from Makkah to Bayt al-Maqdas, Jerusalem. How long does it take? And so he, he answered appropriately that X amount of weeks by mount, if you're t- traveling by camel this long, by horse this long. So as soon as the, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said this, they, they began to laugh and said, Fuzna, that we, we've, we're successful, you're, you're falsified, your messenger has been falsified. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Because he has no idea of what they're alluding to. So they said, well... You've just said it takes X amount of time to travel from here to Masjid al-Aqsa. The person that you claim to be a messenger of God, he has said that he has traveled this journey in the span of one night. So Abu Bakr radiallahu again, the point that I'm alluding to is that why would they make this a point of contention if it was a dream that the Prophet saw? They're only making it a point of contention because the Prophet is saying he went physically. And Abu Bakr at that point when he, he responds by saying that the intellect of Abu Bakr may be wrong, but the statement of the Messenger can never be falsified. So I may not understand how long it takes and I may get those calculations wrong, but if the Prophet has said that he's made that journey, then سَمِعْنَا مَطَعْنَا So the general understanding amongst the Mufassirun and the Ulama, though some differ, is that this journey was both by... Uh, the body and the soul. It takes place, there are a various amount of narrations of when this happens, some up to five, six years before the hijrah, some say immediately after the passing of Khadijah al-Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha, and most historians, they allude to just before the hijrah, a few months before the hijrah. And when you look at the seerah, it seems as if this mi'raj was given after the incident of Ta'if and the difficulty that the Prophet ﷺ had faced from the different tribes and he was being rejected. So this was almost a gift from Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal to the Messenger wasallam. So, Asra, this journey of Isra, many people confuse Isra with the actual ascension itself. Isra is only referring to the journey from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. This takes place on a special animal known as the Burak. Um, the realities of the animal, the, some have mentioned, Wallahu alam. But it carries the Prophet ﷺ alongside with Jibreel والسلام, from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. There, at Masjid al-Aqsa, the Prophet وسلم, he enters the old masjid and he then ties his burak to uh, one of the chains uh, the animals used to be tied to. Nowadays, they, they refer to, um, if anybody's been to Masjid al-Aqsa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep Masjid al-Aqsa safe, um, Allah free Masjid al-Aqsa. Um, when you walk towards the Qibli Mosque after you pass, pass the Dome of the Rock and the Qibli Mosque is in front of you, the mosque that was, that's now erected by Sayyidina Umar al-Khattar on the right hand side, there is before, if you're walking towards the Wailing Wall, there is a small uh, sort of masjid where you go down a, f- a few flights of, uh, s- uh, flights of stairs. That's known as Masjid al-Buraq. 
And many historians point to that is where the Prophet ﷺ actually entered and performed, um, he tied the, uh, the, the burak um, along that wall. It's still open today, you can go downstairs and you can perform prayer if one wishes to do so. So he ties this animal to the, uh, the wall. And from here, there are two opinions. One opinion is the Prophet ﷺ remounts the burak after a few incidents that take place and travels to uh, the different skies where he meets different prophets at each level until he meets Sayyidina Ibrahim Khalilullah in the seventh heaven. Thereafter, he traverses further and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the Prophet ﷺ to reach Sidratul Muntaha. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows him to see Baytul Ma'mur, etc., etc. Um, so that's one opinion. The second opinion is that a staircase is brought down from the heavens that the Prophet ﷺ then ascends. Um, the reality of this, Allahu Alam. You know, what, what, what is the mode of journey that's used? Uh, Allahu Alam. Whether it was a state, I mean, we've progressed as a society. Uh, we, have electric, we have escalators now. You know, so if we, can, we, if we can make escalators, what's difficult for Allah to have a system to take the Prophet ﷺ up on stairs to the different heavens. It's not ba'id. If we can have escalators, that's not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fashion out. Khair. So this journey then continues up to the different skies where the Prophet ﷺ meets different prophets on seven different skies, ends up meeting eight prophets in total because on one heaven, Yahya uh, and Isa alayhi salatu wasalam are together. Um, Yahya and Zakariya alayhi salatu wasalam. And so the Prophet ﷺ eventually meets Allah Rabbul Izzati Wal Jalal. It's a very long story, so we're going to carry on with the verse. And then he returns back. After returning back to Masjid Al Aqsa, it's at this junction that the prophets that were on the heavens accompany the Prophet ﷺ to Masjid Al Aqsa, and the rest of the prophets join as well. And at this place in Masjid Al Aqsa, the, the compound of Aqsa itself, all the prophets gather, and according to some historians, it's Salatul Fajr that the Prophet ﷺ leads. Others say it's just an optional prayer, and the Prophet ﷺ leads the Anbiya والسلام, in prayers at Masjid al Aqsa. And this is one of the unique elements of the area of Aqsa is that in the Aqsa compound, it's very, very easy to say, based on what we've been told in our history, that somewhere, or pretty much everywhere, that you are standing, a Prophet of Allah has stood in that compound. Because we've got to remember here, the, the, the number of Prophets that we, are, we have been told and we've learned from the ulama is over 124,000 Prophets of Allah that have been sent to this earth. So they all accompany the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so SubhanAllah, that, that area, and Allah describes it, الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا hawla. Allah says he's put tremendous blessings in Aqsa. Masjid al-Aqsa, once Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu ta'ala an, he asked the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what's the first place of worship on this earth? The Prophet sallallahu said, Masjid al-Haram. And then he was asked, Ya Rasulullah, what's the second place of worship? The Prophet sallallahu said, Masjid al-Aqsa. What was the gap between them? The Prophet sallallahu on that occasion, in that riwayat, it mentions 40 years. So Masjid al-Aqsa, unlike Baytullah, Masjid al-Haram, which is the Qibla of this Ummah only, all the other Prophets that have come before, their Qibla was Masjid al-Aqsa. Every other Prophet, their Qibla, the direction of prayer was towards Masjid al-Aqsa. It's only when the Prophet ﷺ and this Ummah, the direction of prayer is towards Masjid al-Haram. And so you can see Masjid al-Aqsa is a tremendous, in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not travel with the intention of praying in a masjid. لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاثة. So if you are traveling to another country and then you go to see a masjid, there's no harm in that. What the Prophet ﷺ is saying is that don't go, you know, like, uh, Sheikh Zayed Mosque has no... It's, it's not Islam, it's, it's a masjid, and if you pray there, there's a reward for a masjid. But to travel just to pray in that masjid, there's no, there is no reward for that. It's not, the Sharia doesn't mandate, it says avoid doing that. 
Yeah, if you've traveled to the land and then you pray there, there's no harm inside that. But don't overburden yourself with the concept of travel to pray in a masjid. Except, ila thalatha. Masjid al-Haram wa Masjid al-Hadha wa Masjid al-Aqsa. That Masjid Baytullah, Masjid al-Nabawi, and Masjid al-Aqsa. Outside of those three, it's not even permitted. So this is the, the, the virtue of Masjid al-Aqsa. And by, by default, because of the area itself of Masjid al-Aqsa, the compound being blessed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, sort of extended that barakah beyond. And so there are, what's the barakah? The barakah is twofold. Once it, once, one in terms of its spirituality and the relationship to the akhirah, which you can understand, it's the first qibla in terms of the other prophets, uh, the second house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of worship. And in terms of barakah of dunya, if you go to that area, Syria and the Levant, Allah has put immense beauty in, the, in those areas. We see you know, places like Syria in the news today after it's been wiped out because of the war that's been happening there for the last decade. But you look at pictures of Damascus and Syria beforehand, and subhanallah, this, these are very, very beautiful places. Allah has put barakah, tremendous barakah in those lands. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he extols and he mentions um, many, many virtues of the, the area of Sham, the Levant. And within that is Palestine, within that is Palestine, within that is Masjid al-Aqsa. الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَهُ لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ وَأَتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Musa alayhi salatu wa salam because this is about Banu Israel. This chapter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعَلُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا And we declare to the children of Israel, Banu Israel, in the book that you will surely spread mischief on the earth twice and you will surely show utmost haughtiness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about Banu Israel and two occasions where they went and rebelled against the Prophet's teachings of that time and the result of that. So the first occasion is after Musa alayhi salatu wasalam passes away and according to some books of tarikh, the Prophet Armiya, Jeremiah as we know as, as he's known as, um, the people rebel. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the punishment of you rebelling and causing mischief on the land is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will subjugate you to immense torture in this world and it will have an effect on Masjid al-Aqsa as well. So Bukht al-Nasr a tyrant from Babylon at that time, because of this mischief and because of this rebellion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows Bukhta Nasr to overpower the area. He kills thousands, he enslaves thousands, he destroys Masjid al-Aqsa to its ground, to the levels it to the ground. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says here, he says in the, in, in, in the verse, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ that بَعَثْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ عِبَادًا لَنَا أُلِي بَأْسٍ شَدِيدٍ فَجَاسُ خِلَالَ الدِّيَارِ So when the time appointed for the first of the two, the two uh, so, uh, incidents that Allah is referring to, we dispatched against you some servants belonging to us, having strong aggressive power. This was Bukhti Nasr. Who combed through the houses and it was a promise bound to be fulfilled. Then, ثُمَّ رَدَدَّنَا لَكُمُ الْقَرَّةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَمْدَدَنَاكُمْ بِأَمْوَالِ وَبَنِينَ وَجَعَلْنَا لَكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the tawbah of these people and they were then freed from the enslavement of Bukhta Nasr and they returned to Masjid al-Aqsa. The books of Tariq mention that when, uh, when Bukhta Nasr attacked Masjid al-Aqsa, the area of Masjid al-Aqsa, initially Suleyman alayhi salatu wasalam had built Masjid al-Aqsa with with treasures, with rubies, with gold, with all different jewelry. The masjid was completely... What we see today is not Masjid al-Aqsa. We only know the compound. Even the Qibli Mosque is something that was built by Umar radiallahu ta'ala. 
The original masjid is, is, is no longer there. It comes in the books of Tariq that it, took, it takes Bukht Nasr thousands, thousands of ships to take back the gold and the silver to his area that he had come from, that he then pillaged from Masjid Al-Aqsa itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts their tawbah of rebellion. They come back to their old ways. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows them to return to Masjid Al-Aqsa. Then they rebel a second time. And this second time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to takes place, according to most historians, about 40 to 70 years after the lifting up of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And... It was done, according to some, by the tyrant Titus. And once again, Masjid al-Aqsa is destroyed. The people are killed. Not even enslavement at this time. Most were killed. The ones that weren't had to flee Masjid al-Aqsa. And once again, the treasures are removed and taken away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Then we gave you your turn to overpower them and increase your strength with wealth and sons and made you a greater number. After they did tawbahs, then if you do good, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about two different incidents. And the, the interesting is, thing is that one was after the time of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, the, te- the second was after the time of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Okay? So they went against two teachings, two prophets' teachings, and this was the result. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Asa rabbukum ayyarhamakum. Wa in uddum udna. This is until the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, maybe your Lord would bestow mercy upon you. But if you do this again, we shall do that again. Meaning, if you rebel against the teachings of the messenger, then the result will be that we will cause you to suffer again. Masjid al-Aqsa, and this is where Mufti Shafi Sahib, rahmatullahi alayhi, in his ma'arif al-Quran, he mentions a very interesting point. He says, from these ayat, it seems that the difference between Masjid al-Haram and Masjid al-Aqsa, in fact, one of the imams of Masjid al-Aqsa once, went, once asked a question to a scholar that was visiting Masjid al-Aqsa. And he asked him that Masjid al-Aqsa is so sacred to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then what do you think the reason is for what we are going through in Aqsa. It doesn't happen in Masjid al-Haram. Masjid al-Haram, no matter what period Islam has gone through, Masjid al-Haram has always been safe. Even when there was rebellion amongst the Muslims and other Muslims, nothing happened to Masjid uh, Masjid al-Haram. But... What a, what, why is this taking place with Masjid al-Aqsa? And so that scholar referred to, the, to Ma'arif al-Quran, to Hazrat Mufti Shafi Sahib's notes on this ayah. And he said, because it seems to me, Mufti Shafi Sahib mentions, that the protection of Masjid al-Haram has been undertaken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's not contingent on anything else. Masjid al-Haram is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times, and nothing will change that. No circumstance of the ummah has an effect on that. But Masjid al-Aqsa, based on this verse, where Allah is saying that if you are mischievous and if you rebel, then this will be the result, it seems as if Masjid al-Aqsa's protection is contingent on the state of the ummah. If the state of the ummah is good, then Masjid al-Aqsa is protected. And if the state of the ummah is bad, and if we rebel against Allah's teachings, then the result is that its effect will be felt on Masjid al-Aqsa. And it will not be divinely protected, like Masjid al-Haram is. And so, as Mufti Shafi Sahib, rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentions in, in, in his tafsir there, that the Muslims need to have a real look at themselves. That what's our contribution to the devastation that the Ummah is facing. Now this tafsir was written about 30, 40 years ago. How much worse has the situation become for the Ummah on a whole? 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in verses coming up in the next, uh, in the next ruku, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا أَرَدْنَا أَن نُهْلِكَ قَرْيَةً أَمَرْنَا مُتْرَفِيهَا فَفَسَقُوا فِيهَا فَحَقَّ عَلَيْهَا الْقَوْلُ فَدَمَّرْنَا تَدْمِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when we intend the destruction of a people, we command its people that live in luxury, the commandments, that stick to this, when they go against that, فَفَسَقُوا فِيهَا فَحَقَّ عَلَيْهَا الْقَوْلُ فَدَمَّرْنَا تَدْمِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the people that are in power, when the people that have wealth, when the people that are living in luxury, they become corrupt, what happens? It trickles down. The people underneath become corrupt. If the people on top, the people of affluence, the people of, uh, of persuasion, the people who have power to persuade people, if they are good, then it filters down. And if these people are corrupt at the top, the corruption follows. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, when I intend to destroy a people, then the commandment goes towards the affluent people that rectify yourself. When they don't, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I pick them up and I destroy them. I completely obliterate them. And we can see, if you look around the ummah today, that if, if this tafsir is correct, of what Mufti Shafi Sahib is saying, then, yes, the, we are playing a tremendous part in what's happening to Masjid al-Aqsa. Our deeds, the nahusat, the bad effect of our deeds is being felt by this blessed land of Syria, of Sham, of Masjid al-Aqsa. And its rectification is contingent upon our rectification of our deeds. As an ummah, as a people, if we rectify ourselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring about that rectification in our surroundings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then carries on speaking about Banu Israel and there's some advice, not advice, commandments that he gives and one in specific inshallah that I wish to speak about but time is up today inshallah we'll look at that tomorrow if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills then inshallah we will carry on with that in tomorrow's lesson Allah give me and all of you the understanding wa akhirul da'wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen subhanallah wa bihamdi subhanakallahumma bihamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant nasafirun tubi ilayh jazakum Allah khair assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh